this week, three sides of the coin. What moments saved Kiss's career? And you don't get to save any Vincent. It's not even brought up. Not even brought up. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. I'm one of the two co-hosts, Michael Brandvold, and pretty much always Mark Cicchini. Woohoo! We're, we're week Wait. two. We're in week two with no Ed. Who? Ed. It's always just you and I. It has been for what fucking six years. It's, it's. I don't know. You know. It's like, what does he even bring to the table? Who's this Ed you keep talking about? <laughs> Hello, and, and and it's a little disappointing. We invited the weather girl, but she never answered us. So I don't know if she's getting a little too big for her britches. She thinks Ooh. she's hot shit. We had that one really hot chick on. Wasn't she the goddess of thunder or something? Oh yeah, we should go back. Lee I, looks like we have no fucking choice. Yeah. But look, it, it just happens. Oh well. Oh well. The show is is freaking amazing with just the two of us anyway. Did we did we did we mention last week that it was your 5th anniversary of being on the show? I mean of eating on um, <laughs> eating um, on the show and driving nuts people nuts and, and over interrupt. and talk and talking over the guests. It started 5 years ago everybody. And and, and we're, we're our fingers are crossed and we get 5 more years of crunching on chips ice cubes and talking over guests here exactly no one <laughs> i tell you what no one in the interview business talks over guests better than me I what? Think that's, while oh, that's... crunching on an ice cube exactly <laughs> <laughs> oh what will they complain about next oh they love to hate us that's awesome it's so you awesome do. um all right so yeah tommy's not Tommy's doing, um, as we've always said, work comes first, and Tommy's got an open house. He's going to probably try and call in at some point when his open house is done, and we'll add him back in. But, again, no loss to the show. Exactly. Um, so Stellar. He continues. Don't, don't really have any housekeeping, but there's some thing, little things to mention. First of all, um, if you haven't heard, the last two dates – on this U.S. leg of the End of the Road Tour, Los Angeles and Oakland, which are were scheduled to be within the next seven to ten days, probably. I don't have the dates in front of me. Got rescheduled. They've rescheduled Oakland and Los Angeles to March of next year. Well, the last date was supposed to be the 20th because originally I was going to go. And, right. uh, so that would have been, I think it would have been the 16th. 20th. The 16th was Oakland and the 20th was Los, Los Angeles. Angeles. So it's those staples. were supposed to be the last two shows of this leg of the U.S. tour. Um, Hold on. So would you say this leg? This leg. So there's, there's good and bad that came out of this. I, obviously, I still am I'm getting screwed out of seeing Kiss yet again. So I'm just going to have to wait until next year to see Kiss on this tour finally. Or just um, go on the cruise. Yeah, I mean, we've <laughs> gone down that road many times. Um, besides, I've already booked a jumpy house party for my daughter on November 1st. <laughs> um, so, you know, if you've got tickets for those shows, definitely contact Ticketmaster or wherever you bought them. If they haven't already contacted you because... People who've bought tickets have said they've already been notified. The shows are not canceled. The shows have not been 
postponed. They've been rescheduled. There is a new confirmed date for both of them, March of next year. No no reason has, I don't know if Kiss has even made a statement about it. And they if, did. They said it was scheduling. And scheduling. Now, okay. I mean, I, you know, and, and I can give you a little insight. I mean, it. I kind of sit back. First of all, to me, yeah, I'm disappointed I can't see Kiss, but it's no big deal. The 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 end. It's not the end of the world. Is that? Oh, you know what? So we just get started here, and Ed's ready. So give us a break. Let's get Ed connected, and we'll continue with this. Cool. So, um. All right. So on. so so let's just pick up where Mark and I had just got the conversation rolling, and you just derailed the whole thing immediately so thank you for that it's what i do so uh we were just discussing that oakland and la have been postponed until march of next year um i was yeah. gonna i was gonna say listen it's disappointing if you've got tickets and you're not going to be able to go to it now but it's not the end of the world people it's not the tours failing, the tours crashing, tickets aren't sell. It's none of that because the reality is, in Kiss's case, and frankly, most bands, there's and when you've got a long tour, like a year, two year tour, there's going to be dates that get rescheduled and moved around. It's always happened. I remember it happening a couple different times during the time I worked with KISS because things just come up, routing changes. Um, it's not the end of the world that two dates got moved, okay? So let's just well, stop yeah. the panic. And, and they were talking about it that night, uh, Doc was, and it just sounds like it's a scheduling thing, whatever that whatever that is. It could be any number of things. It's, it's not like they are... Like you said, the tour's not failing. They're not canceling. They're just moving the dates. That happens all the time. You guys got to remember, too, that back in the day, you know, like here we had uh, Brass Ring or, you know, Belkin or a number of all different sections had of the country, you know, Ron Delsner and all these, you know, all these promoters. It's all one. It's all in house. Not, not in house, but it's it's all Live Nation now. Right. These, these, the, it's one, one, you know, one call does it all sort of thing. And, you know, Kiss's tour is all Live Nation throughout. And it's, again, like Michael said, a couple things need to get rescheduled. You got to remember, too, go look at the date. That's September. Um, I don't know if it preseason hockey's getting ready over at Staples Center, or if, the, if there's basketball, or if there's a circus, or if there's. Guys, shit happens in this business. Um, I think I read somewhere that someone posted something of all the events that are going on over there. I mean, just a ton of shit going on. And quite frankly, it sounds to me like Kiss just went, okay, these two dates, we'll move them. Well, it might not and even be Kiss people. saying that. It could be Live Nation saying, listen, guys, we're, mo we're, 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 mov we're moving the dates because we would be more comfortable if we could book them in a time where there's less competition. I, I guess that was the point I was getting. Like, it, 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 Live Nation it basically is king. Kiss is going to go where Live Nation tells them. Li li Live Nation pays Kiss. And, well, I shouldn't. I don't know this for sure, but generally these big tours, they pay the artist a big lump sum. They guarantee them a lump sum for the whole tour for X amount of dates over X amount of years. So they're kind of the boss so to speak i mean yeah kiss and doc can push back but at the end of the day when when live nation says hey we're giving you a million dollars to play this show and we want to move it to next year okay you know it's their money well and are there a lot of people online freaking out about this well there's i think there's just people who aren't accustomed to this thinking it means something else and what i was going to say is oh, yeah. i i know from experience of when i was with kiss there were a couple times where shows got moved or outright canceled because something a great opportunity presented itself and and one of them that came to mind was when kiss um performed under the brooklyn bridge they had yeah. to, they had to cancel a show for that 
Um, so stuff like that happens. I don't know that's the case here. I'm just giving these as examples. Maybe some big TV program said, "Kiss, we want to we want to put you on our show, but we have to record the show, you know, next week." And on it, those days. And it doesn't work with you doing a show in Oakland and then a show in LA. Things happen, so don't don't worry about it. The good thing about this is it basically revealed that kiss has spring dates lined up because there's not going to be right. there's not two dates all by themselves in march there's going to be a no. whole tour around this and also confirms what paul talked about originally remember what he said it's gonna be a three-year tour yep. maybe two to depend on how things go look guys i one thing i i, I think that we can all agree on is kiss fans as long as tickets are selling kiss is going to be torn and that's just what I think is going to go on for the next year or two. And right. that's, just, well, that's just what they do. That's that's the nature of the beast. Every show I've seen has been sold out or damn close. You know, in the St. Louis show I saw last week, there was, I heard 24,000 plus people there. You couldn't have squeezed, you could not have squeezed another person into that lawn that was, area. that was an outdoor shed, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh-huh. And, and listen, I'm not, I'm not, saying that that the promoter because it's not kiss who does this it's the promoter that especially for shed shows that they aren't putting out ticket deals and papering to fill the lawns because that's what they want to do i mean keep in mind many of these sheds are maybe what ten thousand reserved seats under the under the roof and then they can put another ten thousand people up in the lawn behind it and from the promoter's standpoint they want another ten thousand people in there, not because of the yeah, ticket revenue. Eating and drinking. Yes, exactly. Because ten thousand people, one, pay parking. Two, are probably yep. buying some merchandise, which Live Nation gets a huge cut That's of. Food, beer, drinks, and these outdoor sheds. I mean, if, if you've ever been to them, they've almost got like mini malls. I mean, there's all kinds of concessions going on that you can buy stuff. So, now, you know, I was just at Pine Knob last week and craft beer now. This yeah. isn't stuff that, you know, we saw growing up. We saw growing up. You just got your beer, your pop, and you were lucky to get a hot dog or a piece of pizza. Fuck, now they got gourmet sandwiches and all kinds. I mean, they're really spending some money to make you spend some money. So and, yeah. and and the you know so the the promoter has contracts with the people who manage the parking and the concessions and all that stuff. They have con and, they don't just do it on word of mouth. I yeah, exactly, kind of exactly. Food. They have a yearly contract that says if you want to put your restaurant in here, we guarantee you X amount of shows and maybe even X amount of people. So it's in Live Nation's interest to get people in there. That has zero impact on what Kiss earns. Kiss gets a guarantee. Yeah. Whether whether there whether they, there's one person or twenty thousand people, Kiss is getting the same pay. Right. Well, and I didn't see that the tickets even up to the last minute were being discounted. In fact, I saw some stuff come up that was regularly regularly priced, even single tickets, where somebody bought them and then turned right around and, and popped up the value to try and resell them. So, like, the lawn seats for that show, I think, were $69. So, I mean, it sold very, very well. Like I said, you couldn't have you couldn't have taken and shoved any more people into that. Yeah. So, chill out. Relax. It's not the end of the world. The tour's not bombing. Um, any of the idiots out there that are using this as ammunition to say, see, I told you so, just tell them they're full of shit because they don't know anything. It's two dates that got... If 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 this was the end of the road, literally for the tour, they would have canceled the shows, not moved them to another date. Exactly. Yeah, it's not like you spent your money on a ticket and there's going to be a four-year delay. <laughs> They're just moving it to the spring. God. Jeez, oh, Tommy. <laughs> Somewhere someone's going, ouch, that's bleeding. <laughs> oh, jeez. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. God. I did not expect that. I didn't either. That was great timing. <laughs> so yeah, no, I, I like I said, they were talking about it when I was in 
I think it was in St. Louis or, or Des Moines, and, and it was just my understanding is just scheduling. That's all it is. Yeah. Yeah. So you know? re- relax. Be happy. That confirms there's going to be probably a spring summer tour across the U.S. because they'll, you know, Kiss will probably be doing sheds as well, which sheds are not necessarily going to be springtime. It could be a little chilly for it yet. Well, like, I, I, I right. thought that if they're starting, put it this way, I don't know if those are going to be the first two dates. Yeah, we don't because know Because let's that. face it, people, they're, they're not going to do just two shows and go, that's it, we're off for the, you know, once they're they're up and running, they're going to be up and running. So I don't know if they're going to, and, and I'm just speculating because of the dates, middle of March, May, at least, you know, in my neck of the woods up here in the, in the, in, uh, in the Midwest, you know, it, it doesn't get nice till the end of May, and that's when the sheds start start doing stuff so it's possible and again i'm just going on logistics no inside information nothing but if they're going to do those shows don't you think they would do either lost cities or something inside up until they could do the sheds oh yeah i mean it, it, if i was well, to yeah. really speculate that's what i would guess is march april could be a, a, a lost cities Indoor arena shows, although California, they could do the sheds at that point in time. Um, and then you but move into May, June, Twin July. Cities. What was that? They could come back to the Twin Cities because they played Minneapolis, but they haven't played St. Paul. Bon Jovi did the same thing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, and so, they will hit some of these places a second time. I also see them, I tell you what, another great example of that time is obviously they played Detroit and Grand Rapids, but they didn't play Saginaw and they didn't play a Toledo. You right. Know? Well, so, there you I go. Mean, you know. Um, they're, they're, they, they're, I've said this so many times on the show and just in conversations online. There are so many cities they have yet to play that they could play. Just go back right. and look at the tour dates for the last 10 years, and every one of those big and small cities they could be going back to. So that could be Mankato, that can be Duluth, that, you know, there's Cedar there's, Rapids, Iowa, exactly, Lincoln, there's, Nebraska. There's plenty yeah. of opportunity for them to play other markets. So, yeah, I would, I would, my guess would be in March, April tour that leads into sheds for a while and then maybe and, and again pure speculation some of the festivals over in europe because it's well, all even they some do of the good festivals over there. here even some of the festivals here but the I, Euro- I don't think i don't really see them playing those here i think part of playing europe the festival circuit is so lucrative and um and let's face it though too those are you know those are big crowds those they draw over there shows yep mm-hmm Yep. So, so they, they yeah. you know, they, they they could do the festival circuit in in Europe, July, August, and you know, I don't, you know, I don't know. We could speculate. They could go back to Europe. They could do South America yet. That's uh, right. They haven't. They done, haven't they done haven't, South America, and you know they will be doing South America. Oh, they have. They oh, haven't yeah. done a. They haven't even done a full tour of Canada, really. Right. Yeah, that's true. There's going to be plenty of opportunities to see them many more times before this whole thing is over. Yeah. So don't panic. Be happy. This just confirms that there are more dates coming next year, as we all speculated. Um, Mm -hmm. Another quick mention we should do today is the... 44th anniversary of the release of the greatest of album the second of all time. best Kiss Live album, Kiss Alive. The greatest album of all time, ever, by any recording artist, period, exclamation yeah. point. No. Greatest Sorry. live album's Cheap Trick, greatest Kiss Live album's Alive too. Boy, look at the time. Okay. Tommy, thanks for joining us. It's been a great, great, uh, what is it? Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> See, even though I'm not a huge fan of Kiss Alive, I'm giving it the love it deserves, people. 44 years ago, it was released. Yes. Go crank Kiss Alive 2 and celebrate. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh, boy. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I like it. Um... 
I don't know. I don't know if there's anything else we need to say about Kiss Alive. No, uh, Every, everything's so. all everything's already been said about it. It's just hey, forty four years ago, right? It's a pretty big deal. Um, you know, it, all kidding aside, look at the impact that really had on just music in general. Because huge. we're not alone. And when I say we're, you know, a lot of people my age, our age, um, the three of us. Kiss Alive was that that was it that sealed the deal you know um it it, it did for me anyway like I said my older brother already had you know Hotter Than Hell and and Dressed to Kill but I remember hearing like just the live or again you know it's it's so cliche too because it's just like they say in that VH that VH1 special but it's so true you really felt like you were there I mean that crowd noise and the explosion I mean I felt like I was at a football game. What's that? Fourth down. Felt like I was at a Monday night football game. Huh? I, uh... Isn't that where the crowd crowd noise came from a football game, didn't it? Oh. Well, the other thing, though, I think that's important to note is, at least from my perspective, is, is it's one of those few double albums like, um, Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, where I love every song on the record. Every single one. Well, you know what? It's funny, Tommy, because there's so many bands um, that I love. And I I don't know. It's funny because on my personal Facebook every now and then I'll do like my favorite live records or, you know, cover songs or whatever. I've really been toying with doing a song that is the live version is way better than the studio version. And Kiss really does that and, and and i was just thinking you know again i'm just uh, you know uh, talking off the cuff here but if you've ever heard the original version of do you feel like we do by peter frampton and then listen to the version on frampton comes alive there's like no different falls I mean, flat. No, yeah, it's oh, yeah and and you listen to like the the live reo um uh version of riding the storm out and then listen to the studio version you're like holy it's like it's a different it's Fair. it's just amazing how the <laughs> '70s were able to to transform the songs. I mean, in front of it's a almost crowd, like a different singer. I, it's just amazing to me, you know, that that the bands today you don't get that like you did back then. I mean, the live records right. from the '70s were just iconic, and they took well, good songs and the live versions made them great. You know, it just but that but also to that singer, that singer for REO on that second record is horrible. Well, you know what? I actually like the first REO route record. I'm not too crazy about the second one. But do you know there is a version with Kevin singing that in the studio? No, that I have not heard. Yeah, I actually bought the box set. Um, by the way, if you're an REO Speedwagon fan, they have a they have two box sets of their entire catalog, just chock full of rarities and i mean not garbage rarities really good rarities and uh, that was one of them um they did cut a version now keep in mind this is the cool thing about it tommy they cut that version back in the seven you know before you know before the live album came out that was right when kevin was being shown the door so it's just funny hearing kevin on that original you know recording studio version but of course the live version is just so much better but um, you know, I, it's just a, a snapshot in time where, like I said, the the studio versions don't match the live versions. It's just live rock in the 70s captured on analog tape by people like Eddie Kramer, you know, just freaking. And then totally re-recorded in the studio. <laughs> yes, in, in Kiss Alive's uh, kids. <laughs> but, but you know what, though, to be fair, a lot of these... Uh, live, I think I remember reading that Live Killers by Queen had like over 200 overdubs on it. I mean, they a lot of that stuff goes on. And I remember too, even reading because I'm a big Deep Purple fan. Oh, they said originally that uh, Made in Japan didn't have any on it. And then years later, I think it was in the 90s, John Lord was like, Yeah, you know, he did touch up a couple things, you know, uh, for what it's worth, um, you know, but. It is what it is. All I know is when I put the needle on, I don't start going, was that doctor? I don't give a fuck. Just turn it off. I know. You know I just, Who cares? You know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I feel the same way. At the end of the day, it's a great record, and I still love it. 
Yeah. So, so Tommy, you were at the you were at a couple shows last week, right? Yeah, I went to two shows last week. I was in St. Louis at the Hollywood Amphitheater, Casino Amphitheater, whatever it was called. I think that's where the Guns N' Roses riot was. Um, and then uh, I was also in Des Moines at the Wells Fargo Center uh, two days later. So I got to see an outdoor shed show and then an indoor show. And uh, they were both pretty similar. What they have changed is they've removed a couple of the pods and compacted the show ever so slightly to fit it into some of the shed shows they were doing. Um, but, you know, unless you were, like, counting things, you wouldn't know. It didn't, you know, it didn't, it, it, it didn't it, it, take anything away from the show? No, I didn't think so. I mean, you know, the only thing that I didn't see in either show, and I've been watching for it now, is that rocket that's supposed to come out right away. Uh, and I didn't see that at either show. Okay. So, again, that goes back to a fire marshal thing. But it was really cool just to see them put the stage together. We sat around and we watched them test the pyro. Um, I got to see a lot of how the pyro stuff is set up, you know, which explains things to me. Like, because I'm curious about stuff. Like, those two huge flames that come out behind Eric's drum kit during God of Thunder and, and also during 100,000 Years, those things are only about the size of, like, a subwoofer. It's just a small black box that can blast that amount of fire. It's just kind of crazy to think it's coming out of that. It's got so it to cool it. be so freaking hot for Eric up there. Oh, because you could feel it, like, in the 10th row. I can't even imagine, you know, how hot it is for him. And, uh, you know, we watched him, you know, raise and lower the pods and just test all this stuff. It was just kind of neat because it wasn't during the show to actually see some of that stuff function. It was kind of fun to watch them piece all that together. And, you know, we were talking to, um, you know, Fran, Paul's guitar tech while he was stringing the guitars and he was explaining some things because one of the things that I noticed and any of you out there listening that's going to a show watch for this I can't remember what song or songs it's on but Paul's playing what looks like an upside down Ibanez I've and seen a couple pictures of that, that it, yeah yeah and everyone's saying that it, it it's taken from uh, somebody else's idea who who apparently did it as well but Paul just told um Fran or whomever at one point, just, you know, flip this thing upside down. Let's try something different, you know? And it's just, it, it caught me off guard the first time I saw it. I'm like, wow, okay, that's interesting, you know? Um, and then, uh, you know, it was neat to, to watch him get all the prep stuff done for all of Gene's things. So he always, like Mike, the bass tech, always has extra things ready to go, whether it be for the blood or for the fire breathing, whatever. He's always got, like, extra things prepared just in case something gets spilled or there's a problem, whatever it is. So it's like they go to great lengths to double check, triple check to make sure that everything's in place. So you won't have a problem and nothing gets lost. Well, and more importantly, so there's no downtime and delay in the show because there's nothing, there'd be nothing worse than like Gene walking over to get his blood cup and the only blood cup spills before he gets it. And then they're right. running around trying to get new blood and, you know, delaying the show. Exactly. So that's why he had several of each thing set up and ready to go so they can literally be ready at a moment's notice in case there will be a problem. And I know that sounds silly, but it's little things like that that you don't think about. And you're like, oh, okay, well, that makes sense. And, and I think the thing I took away most from the pyro stuff is how, how much it makes sense when you can see how it's being done, you know, like how, where the rockets are launched from and, and all that kind of stuff. But like I said, the thing that surprised me the most is how small the box was that blows out those huge things of fire from behind Eric. I'm just like, really? That's all. Cause I was envisioning something like a huge propane tank with this big thing. And it's like, it's not, you know, so it was just cool to see all that. And then, you know, to watch the fans who did the experience, you know, come through and hold the guitars and, and stand for photos on the stage. It was just neat to see how happy everybody was to be a part of all of that. You know, it, it was just, it was a cool experience. And, you know, a lot of happy fans, saw a lot of Three Sides people uh, there as well. And uh, it was just a cool experience. And, I, you know, if you're not going to this tour, you know, you're, 
you're you're missing out on something really really amazing. And, you know, for all of you bitter people that are original four only, you owe it to yourself to see this. Just Tommy, once. did they use the did they use the cherry pickers that go into the crowd on either one of those shows? Yes and no. They didn't on the casino show and I've seen them at our uh, amphitheater show. I've seen them do it not use it before at the amphitheater outdoor shows. There's just literally no place to put it. So that's a great question mark because what they did differently is during the show typically, you know, those two huge risers that are the round things out front, Gene and Ace will or Gene Ace, Gene and Tommy will get on those and rise to the top during a hundred thousand years. So then instead of doing that during a hundred thousand years, then during the end, that's what they did. They got on those instead of the cherry pickers. And then the next night, uh, the next show in Des Moines, then they had the cherry pickers back. Yeah, I, I noticed the same thing. Uh, it, when I saw them in the uh, when the stadium in Toronto, um, they they had the cherry pickers that went out into the crowd. And hundred thousand years was you know as it normally is. But when I saw them at Darien Lake, which is an outside shed, they didn't have the cherry pickers, and they didn't do that effect during a hundred thousand years. They saved it for the end of the show. So you right. so they and obviously they... have two planned, you know, because of. The, of, of the way the you know the the venue change and change and adapt and then also too they switched out um they switched out do you love me for crazy crazy nights for those of you who don't know that and then also too the other thing of note is now at the end of the show before they go into the encore they've been you know there's the two those two pods up front that we were just talking about that rise up and down um they would go and stand over on the right all four of them together and then they'd walk over to the other side of the stage and do it on that pod as well, which is kind of cool to see them all stand together uh, like that in one small area. It was just, I don't know, it was just kind of cool that they're doing something a little different. Tommy, one other s- small thing, and I, this is something that I noticed between, because I only saw one, one shed show on this tour. I, I, I think I've seen five or six shows total, but only one shed show. Uh, during the Darien Lake shed show, um, they they didn't have uh, Eric's piano rise from underneath. They the road crew physically carried it out to on the stage. On your shed, did they carry the piano out on the stage, or did, was there a way to, to pop up from under the stage? Uh, I'm almost positive it came up from underneath. Okay. I was I was going to say I would be surprised for a shed show because sheds for the most part have their own stage or concrete. Yeah, they yeah, have their own concrete. base. So, and so I might be mistaken on that. I truly don't know. I don't remember looking at that, but I know for sure that they did it in Wells Fargo because I was standing right in front of it when it came up. Which, which was yeah. the indoor show, which is because they bring their own stage mm-hmm. at that point in time. Right. Again, you yeah. Know, I, so I, I was just picking out nitpicky things that because I, you know, I've seen enough shows now that you kind of get it, and those were, you know, because I, I often think I'm like, if you were at Darien Lake and that was your only show, I, you know, I, I, I would have wanted to see, you know, the. But I it's guess it's, the, it's just it's it's good examples of how, you know, they design the ultimate stage. Um, and, and this is a, you know, I'll go off on this a little bit. Um, Robert Long, who designed this stage, who's been with Kiss for decades here. He's, I, I knew him when he was Paul's guitar tech. Um, you know, they designed this great thing, but then part of their job is to understand they're going to play different size venues and different venue configurations. And how can they present this show? without any surprises to themselves, meaning, oh, they roll into town and it's like, oh, it doesn't fit. Now what do we do? No, they already know exactly what they're doing in this town. Um, I was right. I was hanging well, with um, Jeff, the, the guitar player from the Smashing Pumpkins, a couple weeks ago, and he went and saw them over in Europe at one of the shows because he knows Robert Long because Robert used to do some work with Smashing Pumpkins, I guess. And Robert's like, oh, it kind of sucks you came to this show. I think it was a show in Germany or something like that. He goes, because I only, I was only able to load eight trucks in for this stage, and we've got like 15 trucks on tour. Yes, yes. And, and I was going to say that. I saw, I think I counted like 14 semis plus the 15th semi was nothing more than a huge generator. 
And wow. uh, at the amp- amphitheater, it looked like there were several trucks that still had a lot of equipment in them. And my understanding, according to somebody on the crew, is, is that it looks like they removed the outside pods on the edges to make it accommodate, you know, the the setup for an amphitheater, but it, it's everything else like the drum riser, all of that stuff is all the exact same size. So that doesn't change. It's what they take away or put back in on the sides. And then this, that whole row of pyro, which usually goes up the side of the seats in an arena that was put down out front, kind of in front of where like large banners would normally hang saying, you know, amphitheater or whatever the, the festival might be. So, you get the same effect at the amphitheater show. It's just the pyro on the outside edges are just positioned a little differently than they are indoors. That's why I've always preferred. I, I love an outdoor show. Uh, there, to me, there's nothing nicer than a beautiful evening in California sitting outside on a warm night watching a show. But you will always get the best experience if you see a band in an arena. Because it's a hundred percent controlled environment, they can bring everything in. You just keep in mind, arenas are empty shells, and they load yep. everything in there: sound, staging, rigging. Every everything is theirs, as opposed to outdoor well, shows, which, as we've just talked about, have limitations. Well, yeah, and and it was interesting too because they start. I think the the riggers show up at like seven thirty eight in the morning, and by three o'clock in the afternoon, the whole thing is put together, and that's when they start testing everything. But <laughs> it's funny after the show in Des Moines, we went backstage for a little while, and came out maybe an hour later, and it was all gone. I mean, yeah, they were still tearing stuff down, but the stage was completely torn down, and they were bringing down the last big lighting rig. It's always that's easy to have stuff fall fast. down than put it up. <laughs> yeah, but it's amazing how fast they were tearing that thing down. I came back in, I'm like, holy smokes, it's all gone. It was crazy. Yeah, I, I, yeah so I those would, guys. I, I would totally recommend if anybody ever has the opportunity to watch any show, big show, get loaded in and set up, take it. I mean, if that just means sitting in the rafters of an arena or somewhere for five hours, watch it. Because I remember... It was the Psycho Circus Tour out in um, New Jersey the first time I did that. You know, I've been to a lot of shows, but I've never seen a show set up. And I got to the venue at like 8 in the morning and just sat up in the seats. The first thing that was just like, I had no idea, they put the whole stage together at the opposite end of the arena. And and once yeah. you learn why, it makes complete sense. Because as they're putting the stage together at one end, where the stage goes, they're lifting all of the lighting rigs and everything that has to get lifted to the ceiling is being raised up. Then once it's all the, up, the- once it's all up, and the, and the funny thing on the Psycho Circus tour was the drum kit was put together where the stage goes, but it was lifted up into the air. So basically you just had this drum kit hanging midair with no stage under it. It would look kind of odd, but then they roll. And I mean, literally they unlock the wheels on the stage and all the stage crew get together and they push the stage into its place underneath the lighting rig and lower the drum riser down. So it's very cool to watch that whole process. It's, it's quite an operation. Yeah, and they mark everything with chalk, so they have to measure out where everything's going to go before they start. And that someone had said that that can take them over an hour just to make all the chalk markings on the on the ground as to where everything goes. There's that so old, it's, old it's quite the production. There's that old saying: you measure twice and cut once. <laughs> totally. So that's I think that's what they're doing when the riggers show up is they're marking chalk so they know where everything goes. Yep. Um, And so, like you said, measure twice, cut once, so that everything is accurate. But like I said, once you – see, that's the thing that you miss is when you're lost in the excitement of being there and watching the show happen live, you're watching them. You're watching the pyro. You're watching all of the things that happen to make the show. But what you don't see is the show itself. 
So it was really cool to just sit back in like the third or fourth row and just watch some of this stuff get put together and positioned because it takes on a whole new, I don't know, point of view when you're watching the show now that you see how some of that stuff works. And it just, to me, it made it even cooler to see how they set up some of the pyro and where it's shot from and, and all of that type of stuff. Because like when you're watching, you know, um, hundred thousand years or God of thunder, that fire looks like it's right behind Eric, like literally right behind his back, but there's a pretty good distance between him and where that is. It's still hotter than hell, but it, it's just, it's interesting when you see the depth of the stage, really how much that changes. Yeah. Yep. Um, anything else from the shows you want to talk about? No, that was for the most part just really cool, and, and I highly recommend anybody that can do it to to do that ultimate experience. If you're a huge fan and you can afford it, do it, because everybody that I saw doing it had smiles on their faces, and they got to take all these really cool photos, and Keith gave them a fantastic tour, and his, and his uh, helper, Fred, they're super nice people. They're very accommodating, and it was really cool to see them do all that. And then um, I ran into this gal from Brazil. Michael, you'll probably remember she was in Hinkley. Well, Long, I was going to say, is that, is, is, is that the one we met in Hinkley? Yes. And this is her second or third fan experience. So she flew in from Brazil just for a day or two to do this and then fly back. Wow. And I said, well, why do you come here? And, you know, why, you know, why do you do what you do? And she said, well, I come to these shows in the Midwest because she said, I like them better. And they're usually a little bit quieter with the amount of people that are there compared to, say, like in L.A. or New York. Yep. So she said, I just I enjoy it more. Which yep. I thought was interesting. Cool. Yeah, so she's an attorney, I guess, so. Yeah, that was fun meeting her up yeah. in Hinkley. Well, fans from all over the world, you know, and I've been getting also, too, and I think I mentioned this last time, I've been getting so many emails from people saying that they've been going to these shows and going alone and having a blast and meeting KISS fans there. You know, and it's true. I started up a conversation with a bunch of people around me um, before the Des Moines show. Fans just waiting to see the show. It was really cool. And everyone's there for the same reason. They all love the same band that we love. And it, it's just, I don't know, it's just a really cool experience. And, you know, I, I think that it's kind of one of those things that if you don't go and see it, you're going to regret it after it's over. Yep. That's At least that's my, how I feel about it. Yep. There's about a week week's worth of shows left in the U.S. here um, before they're done touring the U.S. this this year. So if you haven't seen them yet, watch for all of the dates for 2020 because they'll be announcing them at some point. I would yeah. think by the end of yeah. the year those those would be announced because you know they've they've got a few weeks off and then the Kiss Cruise and then Australia and Japan. But I'm guessing especially if there's shows already, you know, going on in March that they're certainly going to want to get the word out. So I would certainly think by the end of the year, there'd be some sort of details, first leg or something along those lines. I would think so. Well, and it was also funny too, because Ryan and, and uh, Phil and Christopher uh, were there uh, also with some of their friends and uh, at the, St. Louis show and those guys are always so much fun to talk to and about three quarters of the way uh, through the show uh, here comes Phil, Phil and Ryan rushing up to the front of the stage to start giving Gene a hard time and it's just like you know he was hamming it up for them and the crowd loved it it's just you know it's just it's so much fun to go to do these things that how can you not want to be a part of it I agree so there you go. Uh, um, all right. So, you know, I've got a we, – we've, we've been on for about 40 minutes here, 45 minutes. I've got a, a real simple topic that I thought I would throw out, and it's actually inspired by Kiss Alive and our buddy Jason from Facebook. Um, Jason made a, a, a statement that, you know, 44 years ago Kiss Alive was released – and and yeah, you know, we all know Vinnie Vincent didn't save Kiss, but Kiss Alive saved Kiss. And I wonder, let's do a quick discussion on that. 
it doesn't have to be about a lie specifically, but the question would be, in your mind, what events or activities in Kiss's career, excluding Vinnie Vincent, Mark, <laughs> saved Kiss? Well, wow. I happen to see that thread, Michael, and, and I I agree with what you wrote on there to a degree, to a degree. I think without a doubt, Kiss Alive saved Kiss by saving their record company. Um, if you remember, a matter of fact, Lisa and I both have those documents. Um, a coin was fed up with Casablanca too. They were already and talking was, to other record labels. Correct. At, that time. At, at, that, at the time of Kiss Alive, and a lot of fans actually don't know this, unless you're a three sides viewer and you know, talk about it. But um, a coin was really fed up with with uh, Neil Bogart and Casablanca, and you know didn't think they were getting the support that they. Um, deserved and, and keep in mind now too Kiss was on the road they still weren't selling a lot of records but they were certainly selling concert tickets and these other labels knew especially like a label like Atlantic or one of these bigger labels knew that if they promoted them with the power that they had you know those big companies they'd sell even more tickets and they'd start selling a lot more records and you know um, that whole issue went away once Kiss Alive started selling you know, that that whole, you know, changing record companies and everything. Um, well, was, went... Wasn't part of the issue also that Casablanca owed Kiss money? Yes. You know, royalties, basically. And and it was because of the success of Alive that Casablanca became cash rich and was able to pay Kiss all of this back money which then made them happy so they wouldn't leave. And I think they already had an offer to go to Atlantic Records, if I remember history. Um, that, was, that was the, the likely go-to that KISS was going to move over to. So, at, you know, the thread Mark was talking about, my, my comment was um, a live saved Casablanca, but it wouldn't have... It, it, without a live, it wouldn't have killed Kiss. They were already, they basically had a deal in place to go somewhere else. So Kiss would have continued, no problem. In the, in it, what I said was, um, re, the success of Beth really quietly saved Kiss behind the scenes. I mean, who was it that we had on that basically said the success of Beth is what financed the whole tour of Japan? It made it a it well, made it a reality for Kiss to be able to go to Japan. Kiss would have before you a certain tier. They wouldn't have without Beth. Yeah, it took them to the whole nother level. And and as we all know, the, histor historically, when Destroyer was first released, it wasn't well received by anybody. Anybody, it it was struggling for you know a Bob Ezrin album and a great slick production. It was not well received, so um, well here. The success, yeah, the, the here. shout it out loud single went to number one in Canada. Let's let's. let's, let's, no, let's I'm let's, serious. Let's, I mean, let's be honest. That's Canada. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but you guys are overlooking one. Im Canadian. So. You're overlooking one important thing before you get to the best piece, and that is with a live. To the best of my recollection, being a kid. The live version of Rock and Roll Night was the first song I heard in heavy rotation on the radio. Yeah. So that. that also, even though, you know, Beth may have financed the tour of Japan and put him on a whole nother level, Rock and Roll Night did the exact same thing on a different tier because that's what really helped sell that record is that song was so catchy. And, and I don't know how you two feel about it, but... I don't like that song on Dress to Kill. I, I'm like, ugh. Well, but to, Mar to, to, Mar to Mark's phenomenal. point earlier, that's a great example of a live version of a song that I think is much better than the studio version and is seen that way by pretty much anybody. I mean, 
if if somebody yeah. plays rock and roll all night on the radio, they're usually playing the live version of it now. Right, and and back then too, everyone needs to remember this was before MTV. This was before the internet. So radio was king. I mean, it really, truly was. So to get your song on the radio in heavy rotation on an FM radio station, rock radio station, was a pretty huge feat to well, accomplish. Did, and I really had... With, without social media, keep in mind, and yes, Kiss was in Cream Magazine and Circus and stuff, but a, a large chunk of those people who heard rock and roll a night on AM radio had no idea what they looked like. You no, know what I mean? That, they let, that, it was the music, the music first. As, as, the, as they say, the music did the talking. There. I mean, a good song is a good song, and that song, you know. Matter of fact, I think I think it was in Scott Ian from Anthrax's book that I read that he heard rock and roll night on the radio before he knew it was Kiss. You know what I mean? And when he put the two, yeah. and two together, that's when it was magic. You know what I mean? He loved the song first and foremost, and then he's like, oh, my God, it's those crazy you know guys that look really cool wow you know what a what a great marriage you know what i mean so yeah uh, well and that's why even though to your point michael the whole thing with death i agree with all of that wholeheartedly but considering how screwed up you know casablanca was i mean you never know if they would have survived or not without the live record because it certainly turned them also onto a huge new audience of people that didn't know who they were but you know and i'm sure there's just as many people like scott ian who thought the same thing that were also thinking oh god these guys look horrible okay i don't like this song anymore well see i i i and i was looking at this saved kiss from almost a a life or death type of statement it, either they but they cease they cease to exist or they exist and and the way i saw it they were going to exist even if Alive didn't happen because other labels were already interested in that, keeping the band alive and keep. Now, yeah, we have no idea what could have happened. Maybe they would have done one album for Atlantic, bombed, gotten dropped, or whatever. But right. But we do know that without Alive, Casablanca probably would have been history for sure. It was life or death. Absolutely, for Casablanca. It wasn't. It wasn't literal life or death for Kiss, but it did do a lot for Kiss's career. I'm not, I'm not, not disputing that. Right. I just, I don't see it as one of those. If you don't do this, your career is over. And they've got a couple other of those things down the road in their career that they also, you know, made the right decisions on. But couldn't it also be like baseball where you're down by a run or two and the first home run you get is alive? Well, if they don't follow it up with another home run, they could cease to exist oh, again. You know, you're so I think it actually happened several times. You're 100%, cool, 100% you know? right. Like, like I said, I mean, if they didn't have the hit with Alive, sure, maybe they would have been signed by Atlantic Records. Atlantic would have done an album. Maybe that album would have done typical Kiss sales, which to Atlantic would have not been phenomenal. And they might have dropped them. Right. I mean, think of it this way. Thankfully, Kiss came around or Mark would be collecting Bay City Roller stuff. You know, if, getting back to what you're talking about, Tommy, the cars are a great example of that because the first record that they released was damn near a greatest hits record. And it was just their debut album. I mean, the, just about yeah. every one of those songs was played on the radio. Now, for I'm not sure which which if my timeline is correct here, was Candio second? Yeah, I think it was. I well, God, I love that record. But anyway, and, so and then Panorama. Yeah, Panorama that's, that's kind of fell Panorama flat. Took, Panorama did nothing, and then shake but it shake up. Shake it up, Ooh. then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, so that I guess I, the reason I brought that up is, Kiss could have survived a destroyer without Beth. You know what I mean? It. it yeah. You know what? It maybe would would have went gold, or maybe not so. Or, but then they would have had but, another chance at bat. You know what I mean? But um, then, here, but wait a second though, because what if without death, maybe they wouldn't have gotten the slot on um, Paul Lynn's Halloween special, which to me was like uh, Beatles going on Ed Sullivan. Sure. You know, well, so I mean, it all. I think it all falls together. Oh, it 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 definitely does. And this is, I mean, just so everybody, this is just a big what if. I mean. Yeah. You know, it's it's one of those things of like, well, you know, if you had the opportunity to change something in your life, would you? 
Well, the answer is probably no, because if you changed one thing, you know, this is getting into the whole Star Trek time travel shit, which is way over Mark's right. head, because he can't even make a router work. Um, <laughs> this fucking router's been incredible. Thank you know, you. You, change one, you change one thing in your past, and, you know, you might have a completely different life today. So yeah. It, yeah. Th- th- these are just fun things to look at, you know, what sa- what events saved KISS is more of what were some of the significant milestones in KISS's career that that allowed them to succeed and or continue? I would say Alive 2 is another one because it was so highly anticipated and they were at the peak of Super KISS at that point that that was huge because so many people anticipated that record to come out. And with the packaging and the cover and everything, it kind of kept pushing them, you know, because the solo albums was, was a misstep for a lot of people. So they're probably also lucky they came back with I Was Made for Loving You or they might have been in the hole. Who knows? Well, I, I, I would say, you know, as you move forward, I think we've, we've all basically said this and agreed, Creatures of the Night, saved their career it gave them another another year to survive basically the fact that they were able to release a true hard rock metal album kept them alive even though it didn't sell it it yeah it kept them alive to do lick it up which that with lick it up following it and the success it started to see basically rejuvenated their career if if Creatures of the Night had been a dud like Unmasked or Elder, I think would have been over. Yeah. By the way, uh, Tommy, uh, can we talk about our guest coming up's uh, book? I can't see why not. Yeah, because I re- I'm going to show this because it is a- I love the cover. Uh, I just I haven't see- looked at it yet. Did you get yours? I haven't looked at it. I haven't looked yet, so it may be at home. I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, we're going to be talking to Gary Craig. What, you, Prado. Is his last name Prado? Is it, yeah. is it is it Greg or Gary? Right, Greg. Sorry, Greg Prado. I've uh, I just got this early today, and boy, oh boy, is this good. So, um, just started getting into it, and wh- when is Greg going to be on, Michael? Um, he's going to be on in November. In November, closer to when the book gets released. So I, but very... we've got Steve. We've got Steve Roth coming up, who works at the publishing company, who worked for Universal. He'll be coming up to kind of give you guys some like insight ahead of time. Yeah, let me let me tell you, uh, guys. Um, you're going to want to pre-order this because I think you can pre-order. Um, take it, take it from me. Got got this today. Um, it came unexpected. I didn't know. I thought maybe we might get a PDF or something. I didn't know we were getting physical books. Oh, my. Oh, my. This is a must-have. Great stuff inside. Great, great stuff. So, uh, well, another book. So, 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 you know, we've got Creatures of the Night that, that kept them alive. But, you know, taking the makeup off pretty much allowed them to get through the 80s. I mean that was oh, a, that, that, it. that was the, that was a big savior. Yeah, that was a and big the savior to and them. the single. Yep, the single, the the video, the MTV play it got, and just taking the makeup off kept them alive for the next ten years, basically. Yeah. Here's the thing, though, if you want to really go back and really boggle your own mind or think about things, what if the original lineup never would have split? Because a, there'd be no lick it up. I don't think that group of musicians would have been able to hold it together through the 80s, um, especially with the hair metal. Say, say, say Peter stayed, Ace never left. I don't think they had the dynamic to compete to, pros- to prosper through through the 80s. That's because, well, that's, they had to make they had to make lineup changes because look at one of your favorite bands, Deep Purple. They needed to do the same thing to survive as well. 
Yeah, but but the but the the reunion one did well in the eighties. But I mean, that's Mark too. That's the the famous lineup. They did well during the. Uh, um, uh, Perfect Strangers sold very well. That tour did very well. House of Blue Light, the, the tour did very well. Um, yeah, but th- to get to that point, you still had memberships, you know? They just did an earlier um, reunion than Kiss did, but it's the same kind of thing. They needed to go through what they went through to get to where they are now. Oh, a lot of, a lot of bands did. I mean, granted, Aerosmith's back, you know, back, uh, you know, but they went through a little time where they switched members too i mean mark 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 your state yeah. your statement is actually really interesting i mean that's kind of mind-boggling when you think of it was kiss saved because ace and peter fucked up in a lot of ways i've thought about that a lot because i don't think and if you go back to the the problems they were having but just say neither one of them wanted to quit you know what I mean? Say Ace didn't want to quit Kiss, and Peter didn't want to quit Kiss. And they and 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 they didn't do enough stuff to force Gene and Paul or three quarters of the band to fire them. It just continued on its own. Yeah, because I don't think image wise they would have been able to to pull it off. No, nope. no, nope. they barely pulled it off with just Gene and Paul. And you could arguably say there was, even though it was the hair metal era. Some of them. They, they, some. they. If you think again, timelines everything. So if you remember watching MTV when it came on, before everybody was starting to do videos and redo their looks for MTV, you all of a sudden were going, "Holy crap, Kansas is an ugly band." Holy shit! What am I? Guess, yeah. <laughs> the, you know these 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 are not pretty bands that we're looking at here on MTV. I Mike, think I think the original four Kiss guys would have been in that group of like you should have what, left the makeup on. What, what really made me think of this, and and this is a great song, and it was a, a minor FM radio hit. But if it, um, Uriah Heep's, if that's the way that it is, <laughs> here's a perfect yeah. example. Now, if, I'm, all kidding aside, if you were to you put that jam on on the radio, or you yep. just hear that, that is a great great yep. single. I mean, a fucking awesome song. But you go look at look the at video. the band, and you're like, "Oh God!" Oh my God! I remember because I and also though too. I was a I was I've always been like just a casual Uriah Heep fan, not a not a huge fan, but Mick's a good guitar player, and always like Lee Strumming, and you know what I mean. I but I think David Byron was their singer in the '70s, but by the time yeah. they to the '80s, they that band just didn't age very well, and and. Again, that song was a, a a big. It was a pretty decent sized hit, at least here in the Detroit area. You know, it got a lot of airplay. But I here think too. what killed it was the video. I mean, because if you that you know that's where somebody like ZZ Top or one of these bands that they're just smart to put a bunch of hot girls and cool cars in there because you know those faces aren't selling you know records. Their faces. The faces only a mother could love. Correct. That's what you're trying I guess, to say. I guess ZZ's a bad example because, uh, you know, but 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 Uriah Heep's not. And again, if you get a chance, uh, it's a song, it's off, like, Abominog, is, is a, which I yeah. had that record. It's actually a really good record. But again, the way that it is is such a great, well-written song, perfect for hard rock radio in the early 80s. It's just, just a phenomenal song and a great single. And it did pretty well, but that video is just tough to watch. And the funniest, <laughs> another funny part is, they they did now Tommy, I don't know if you remember the video well, but they almost like I don't think I've it. ever seen it. Well, I, I think they almost matched it with not putting very good looking girls in it too, because it oh, almost Jesus. been too much of a stretch. Because that is one un but I remember seeing that and you know, years after the fact going and that's when it kicked into my head. I'm like are you guys familiar with some of the pictures that Ace went and visited Peter probably around 81, 82, and Ace's hair is pretty short. And, I just saw that the other day. I just saw that picture know, the other day. I know what you're talking about. Yeah, so I'm like, those guys did not weather the early 80s well yep. at all. Yep. But I'm thinking to myself, God, if that, if you would have put them in the same band with Gene and Paul, they would, they would have looked like what Gene used to say, you know, four guys standing at a street corner. They didn't look like well, a band. Re- rem- remember, after Peter left Kiss and he took the makeup off, he grew a beard. 
Now, we, we, all, we all know something as simple as growing beards and full facial hair didn't fly with MTV. No, because then he looks like Michael Matano. It, it, and, and, you know, it might seem odd for younger <laughs> listeners hearing this, but a video can kill somebody's career. Take a look Billy Squire. at Billy Squire, Rock Me Tonight. Prior to that, that video, his career. he was, that the album, The Stroke, fabulous album. Great it's rock and roll. Huh? The Dark. Yeah, the well, dark. That, that has the album, the, stro- the song, The Stroke on it. Lonely um, as the Night. Yeah, in the yeah. dark. And then he follows it up, and I, I just got to say, here, here's your homework. Go watch Billy Squire Rock Me Tonight. Watch that video and and tell me that that wasn't just like an embarrassment. It's Mark dancing around listening to Kiss Alive. <laughs> hey, what was what was the on, on on that hold on though, but there was a big song off of that. What was the title? What was the that Billy Squire song? Uh off the preview. No, that was uh... But that was off the last record before that. The big yeah. one off of the, the, the Mar, that what, Michael's talking what, about is Rock Me Tonight. That was his yeah, big song. Yeah, hold on a second. But what was the one? Oh, Everybody Wants You. Yeah, and that's off of In the Dark. Is it? Yeah, that, The Stroke. There's several of them on that. That record was huge. That record was huge and had so hold many. On a second. I, I, again, I'm not saying I, I could be 100%. I thought that. I thought. Um, Everybody Wants You was off the next record. I don't think that was on The Dark. I could be, again, I could be wrong. Billy Squire in The Dark is from the album Don't Say No. That's it. That's, yes. Yeah, well, that's where I got everything wrong. And Don't, don't Say No say, has yeah. In The Dark, The Stroke, My Kind of Lover, Lonely Is The Night. I, I, I mean, I mean, I would also hold on, say... Every, hold on, but Everybody Wants You was on the next record. Well, was I thought on, for sure it was in... Because okay. I, that's what I thought was always odd about that thing with the bad video, because the the other song was a huge radio song. Um, what was yeah, but he didn't oh, make yes, a video you're, for you're, you're, it. You're right. You're right. You're right. Everybody wants you was the the lead track on um, Motions in Motion. That's it. That's the name of the album. And that has rock 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 me tonight or whatever. That's that's got that on it. Um, actually, but hold rock on, hold me tonight on. must have been the first video though. Because I don't ever remember seeing a video for Everybody Wants You, and that just pretty much killed his career. No, until no, I, I, I want to say it was like we, we, we got we got to make a correction here. Rock Me Tonight didn't come off that album; it came off the next album, ah. Signs of Life. All right. Oh, no, that's sense. what it because, is. Because, okay. Because Everybody Wants You was like a radio staple. He was fucking huge. Yeah. He was a huge yeah. AOR guitar rock staple. I mean, I, I didn't go to the show, but I remember um, when he toured in support of, um, uh, what, what was the album here? He toured in support of... Um, Emotions in Motion? No, don't, I saw when, that when, tour when, with when, Def Leppard. When, yeah. Was that? I thought it was the Don't Say No tour that he had Def Leppard open for him. Mm, uh, I thought it was the next one. I don't remember. I would just remember going to that but, show. But any, Def, anyway... Pyromania, he, just come out. He was he was he was playing and selling out arenas, and he had like Def Leppard on one of their, if not their first tour of the U.S. opening for him. Yeah, he was. He was yeah. Billy Squire was a guitar rock staple. Listen to those first yeah. couple albums. Tell me they don't just freaking rock and then tale of the tape the very first one also had uh, i was gonna say that too that that was great with, too. with mr bruce, bruce kulik on it too by the way and then and, and then and then watch rock me tonight and go what the hell happened and and basically anybody who was around at time was like that just killed his career it was over he couldn't be touched yep. And then he came back with that song, Don't Say You Love Me, which is awesome, which was like three or yeah, four years that. later, I but he just that. couldn't gain ground. But yeah, it, he just it, couldn't it, gain it, ground anymore. It just goes to show how important the right image and the right look in a video was back then, that it could make a career and it could turn your or career break. off overnight. So when you had all these bands from the 70s who wrote great songs and were killer live in concert, but you put them in a nice video, 
And you're like, but you're not a bunch well, of pretty boys. You don't look nice. You don't look. Yep. You're not sexy. And who's, whose idea of that video? Whose idea was it for the video, Bill LaCoin? Oh, I didn't know that. Was it? Yeah, because he was managing Billy Squire at the yeah. time. And I remember reading something where Billy's like, I'm not too sure about this. And Bill's like, oh, no, it's great. It's great. And and so Bill is kind of partially responsible want you, for the explosion. I want you to roll around on a bed. Come on, Billy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you guys, gotta, you guys got to know the backstory too. That you know, Bill, Bill was was didn't he manage Piper? Piper, yep. Yeah, and I tell you what, that that debut. That if you put it this way, if you're a Billy um, Squire fan, you're going to want to get uh, the, the first Piper record. Really, really good. Matter of fact, I actually have. Matter of fact, Ken Sharp wanted me to make a and I eventually did. But um, they Piper made a live. A radio station only live album. I mean, it's like only like four songs, but the fact that they weren't around for very long, they were on one of those. Do you remember back in the 70s? They used to have those late night rock radio, almost like magazines, you know, but they were, you know, they were kind of like that Burns Media thing that I played for Kiss. But I have, I yeah. have just pure dumb luck. I had one with uh, Ted on one side and Piper on the other. And uh, very rare piece of vinyl, but you know, it's Billy Squire was was the goods man. I mean, he had the pipes and he could songwrite. I, I was going to say, if you like Billy Squire's music, that I, I see what Bill Coin heard in that band. I mean, it was a good band. Oh yeah, um, yeah. So, anyways, get the Piper record. You'll be happy. Get the Piper record. Check out the first few Billy Squire albums. Your first homework. Watch that video. And let us know your reaction to seeing that video. Um, yeah, so it, so it so killed his career. But 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 back to Mark's point, you're right. I mean, it's pretty interesting to think if if the original four guys and Kiss stayed together into the '80s and took the makeup off, because I think that inevitably would have had to happen anyway, even with the original four. Um, that pro that could have killed Kiss's career because they. They wouldn't have been able to compete with what was going on at the time. Well, and I Love It Loud was such a great video. The whole thing, the concept, the look, all of that. That helped them even if the record wasn't selling because it showed people, like, hey, these guys play rock and They're roll back. still. They're back. Yeah. They can still do yeah. it. Yeah. So, yeah, that's very. That's an interesting Interesting thing to ponder there, Mark. Um, I, I I would then move forward, and I think it's pretty obvious that putting the makeup back on saved Kiss's career. Oh God, yes. Because they because weren't they almost at the same point after Revenge that they were kind of at at Creatures. No, you're exactly right. It you kind know, of run it. It ran its course again. It's it and where'd ran, they go? South America. South America. You go go out of the country. Where you're not overkill, and um, not the band, just you're not overkill in that country. Um, yeah, so, you know, in the 80s, they went to Australia, kept them alive. South America, um, after Revenge, or after Creatures, kept them alive. Um, you know what? It's right. funny when you, it was a slip of the tongue, but even after Revenge, they went down to South America again. That's what I was getting at. Yeah. I mean, they... Uh, guys, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier about Kiss booking shows for 2020. This band is a creature of habit. They, go look through the career. They do. It's easy to see what they're going to do next if you're paying attention. It goes back to what I said. Look, man, as long as tickets are, sell, are, sell, are they're selling, they're going to keep touring. I'm not saying they're going to keep touring until 2028, but, I mean, they did very well this, this year. They're going to do very well again next year before they... I do think they are going to call it a... You know, I, I'm going to take them at their word. I do think they're going to call it a day. You know, maybe end of next year, early 2021. I don't know. Unlike I mean, some other bands, we know. From, none of this is any sort of inside. It's just me, you know, riffing, as they say. Uh, again, tickets sold well. There's a ton of places they didn't play yet. And like we were just talking about too, when when things went soft for Kiss, they went out of the country to play. Mm -hmm. uh, keep in mind, uh, there's a reason they didn't tour for Unmasked here, because they wouldn't have played 
the places that they wanted to play. But they knew if they went to Europe, they'd be able to do real well, and they did. And obviously, they went to Australia. But think about that Australian tour, though. It was only like, what, a week? Not yeah. even? Yeah. Kinda, yeah. You, you, as a KISS fan, you feel like they were in Australia for like six months. It's like, <laughs> no. <laughs> no, nope, yeah. just a handful well, of days, that's really. the amount of press they got. Yeah. You know? Yeah, listen well, to Mark you know, people. He's a riff master. He, he, really, he really nailed that, how, you know, it was really like a year's lead up and then nothing. And then the next thing came in, which was, I don't know if it was New Romantics or whatever it was, but, you know, the next fad came and, you know, but, invaded. But, 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 but you're right, Mark. I mean, with, or was it Tommy, you were saying with, with Revenge, th- you know, they'd lost their steam again, a la Back to the Creatures era. We, we know Revenge Tour was poorly attended. The album um, barely made gold. Um, they and it's not always their fault. Sometimes they're a victim of circumstance. Well, yeah, look the, at how the music the music climate uh, again. Yeah, the music climate changes again. But they really got to a point. I mean, I I even remember back in in '95 thinking to myself, man, the reason they're doing this convention tour is to give themselves another year of, of life. I mean, they can do this and look successful, even though they can't sell out, you know, an arena anymore. Right. And it's so funny because I remember at the time people, some people, not everybody, some people bitching about $100 for a ticket. And that's like a steal nowadays. And it was amazing that you got what you got for that $100. Whole day event. Jesus, that was so great. Yeah, but it was brilliant. It was brilliant. So, 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 you know, yeah, they were losing their steam. They were losing their appeal. They had to put the makeup on, and it saved their career once again. It, and, and saving their career, meaning if they hadn't done that, there's a good chance KISS would have stopped existing because there was no demand for tours. There was no demand for albums. There was no demand for anything from KISS, you know, in that revenge getting through the 80s was almost like floating in a boat in the middle of the ocean waiting for the tanker to pick them up which was the reunion tour yep yep you know because it's like the timing again was perfect and now everyone's all sentimental about the 70s and you know i'll never forget going to those shows and seeing so many people i knew that i went to high school with that there was no way in hell they liked kiss at the time and now it's like oh we're going to see kiss you know, it's like, oh, you're finally figuring out something I've known for, you know, 20 years. Right. Right. If you would have just stopped and listened, you know. It's just interesting how things kind of come around in a circle. So do you guys think there are any other events, moments, albums, activities they did that saved them? Of course they did, but if I start talking about them, I got to wait to fucking eat dinner even longer. We've been in an hour and a half. So I guess it's going to be part two to get so, the answer to so, that question. So, so, so Mark is Mark is torpedoing a great topic because he's freaking hungry. Yeah, pretty the much. The masker is hungry. <laughs> God. Lord. You know it's funny. You know we laugh about this, but but. Um, like I said a couple weeks ago, I was hanging with Jeff from Smashing Pumpkins and and a good friend Dave Lopez from Band Flipside. They're both big Three Sides listeners, and we got to get Jeff from the the Pumpkins on because he's got some great stories. Yeah, they, that'd be great. They were they were laughing and talking about how Mark ends shows because he's hungry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, that's not a bit. It's not a bit, it's not a bit guys. It's gonna... real. Hold on, double whammy today, because last night was the start of my hockey season, so I had a game at 10-15. I'm sore as fuck, or I'm sure you guys know, I've just been, Ugh. I, you know, I got like I know, four hours. that was just your usual self. And thankfully, you're not talking over us today. Oh, yeah. Oh, I <laughs> yeah. did that a bit, too. But anyways, I'm fucking tired as hell. I had a long day at work. I had three meetings today. I'm just fucking dead tired. I'm fucking hungry. I just... It was funny because earlier when Tommy said he was late and, and you know our guest canceled today, I'm like, oh Mike, please fucking cancel, please fucking. But 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 you know what, Mark, I, you got to learn to bribe me with something. <laughs> it's it's like anything else. Though. Yeah. All kidding aside, look, there's thousands of people every week that thank you for 
thank you for making sure that you get my lazy butt off the fucking couch to come down in the basement and do this. Because I've had a I've had a ball the last hour and a half, but now I'm at the point where you know what? Okay, I, I could keep talking for another fucking hour, and then it would take that much longer to get to fucking dinner. And I want to get to dinner now Ma- Ma- because I'm tired and I'm fucking hungry. Mark is at the point of get in my belly. <laughs> Absolutely right. Absolutely well, Michael, right. maybe. Maybe he can bribe you next time with Lions season tickets. I don't think he'll need them. Oh, oh so so let's let's do a quick roundtable. How and we'll no, we'll, 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 no. we'll speak no, for Le- we'll speak for time, ladies and gentlemen. We'll speak Let's for Lisa talk. as we'll speak for Lisa as well. How did all of our football teams do opening week? Tommy, uh, Vikings crushed it. Yeah, looked awesome. Yeah, Mark. Sorry, Chris we're, Burns. We got. We didn't. Oh, we're not in fucking last place in the NFC Central. Or in, in the <laughs> we got that going we're for not, you. <laughs> we're not. We're not fucking in last place. That's all. It's true. Next issue. Next issue. How, 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 how the Steelers do, guys? Who? The Steelers. <laughs> I saw a meme today that said the only st- uh, touchdown the Steelers got in Foxborough was when their plane landed. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Lisa. She's a fan Don't of the Ste- she's a fan of Steelers bullshit. and hates hummingbirds. What a messed up life. Oh my god. <laughs> That's fantastic. So no, let's go let's let Marco eat. All right, yes. guys. So yeah, how, let's. How, you got your first homework question related to Billy Squire. Second homework question. What events, activities, albums, anything do you think saved KISS? And I and and not yeah. just made them, you know, more successful, but literally it was like a life or death moment. That if it didn't happen, the, there was a good chance the band would be over history, no more. And also, also, guys, what? what Kiss song is so much better live than it is in the studio? Yeah, I can think oh, of and, and Black how- Diamond on Kiss Alive is like so much better than the studio version. And I love the studio version, but Kiss Alive and um, the, the Kiss Alive version of Black Diamond is just the shit, boy. That is that is just quintessential live kiss. And how many weeks till the Lions are in last place in the NFC? <laughs> <laughs> hey, guess what? We got the same amount of Super Bowl rings, don't we, Mr. Vikings? Spin it, <laughs> spin it however you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I want to know. Here's here's I kind of proudly here's the Detroit Lions Super Bowl ring. How many, how many play? How many playoff wins? Hold on. How many do you got? I just want to see them. How many? How many fucking Super Bowl rings do the Minnesota Vikings have? That's what this is about. This is about oh, no, me feeling no, no, better no, no, about no, my no. club. How uh, many Super Bowl rings do the Minnesota Vikings have? I, Answer I, I, the I, same amount as the Detroit Lions. I feel like Mark is starting to get a little testy about the Detroit Lions. The way you watched an eighteen point fucking lead disappear in the fourth, and you fucking not get all pissed off the, about the, it. The same way Izzy starting to get testy about Seven Eleven. Yeah, and it wasn't even the fourth quarter. It was like the last five minutes of the fourth quarter. Oh, well, can we? That, start, that was what made it worse. Now. Okay, yeah. Mark will eat. <laughs> you guys got your homework. I fucking um, hate you guys. We, we... <laughs> I quit. <laughs> there you go. You heard it here first. Mark just quit because he hates quit us picking again. on him. He picked again. we're picking again. on him. Um you know what we've got let me let me let me go back here. Um we've got a ton of guests coming up. And Whoa, we sure do. Um Come on, where is this stuff? Oh, I can't find it there. I want to. I want to just give you guys a kind of a rundown because we re- we revealed a couple of them. Um, we've got uh, today was supposed to be Rick Stewart who was returning to the show. He'll be coming back. He was sick under the weather, so he had to cancel. Um, oh. This one's really cool, and I I kind of imagine Mark going fanboy maybe on this. Johnny Z from Megaforce Records. Ooh. John oh, Zula. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's gonna, gonna be, be awesome. Talking about Ace Fraley signing. Um, huh? No, no. Talking about him signing Metallica. Meta- well, yeah, we're gonna get into all of the cool stuff like that too. I mean, 
Metallica, Anthrax. Um, but of course, we got to ask him about Ace Frehley because we we no, know Ace, we, he's part of the story. Is cool, but any shit. But the but but we part, because we know from Eddie that Johnny was not an Ace Frehley fan and had to be talked into signing Ace. Mm-hmm. So that's interesting. That's interesting. I want to get into yeah. more of that. So um, that's coming up in a couple weeks. Um, like I said, we'll get Rick Stewart scheduled, uh, rescheduled. I mean, we've got um, Stephen Roth. You mentioned we've got some of the fine folks from Gene Simmons Cola coming. Um, Greg Prado. Um, who else am I missing? Oh, Rick Monroe. Rick Monroe. Rick Monroe. So we got a bunch of cool guests. And Mark, and I won't mention this one, but before we hit the record button, Mark dropped a couple huge. And I mean, I mean, one of these guys is freaking gold, Jerry, gold. I mean, yeah. It's going to be a freaking jaw-dropping right. episode of stuff that has call, never Tommy, been known I mean, before. We're done. Call, call me and I'll, 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 so this is going to fucking, this is jaw-dropping stuff. Jaw-dropping, yep. Only right. here on the most hated podcast. I thought we were the most loved, too. Well, I, I, Dr. Fuck loves me. Yes, he does. <laughs> and I didn't even you have know. to pay him to say that. All right. I Who's know. Good night, Gracie. All right. You know where to go. Yeah. Facebook.com slash three sides of the coin. Three sides of the coin dot com. Instagram, Spreaker, YouTube. We're everywhere. Please. Well, by the way, Mike, Mike, what number are we in the United States worldwide or whatever? I oh, love those stats. Oh, yeah. Yeah, let me... Um, let's crow a little bit. Let's crow a little bit. I got to find the exact numbers. We are... Our episode with Mark talking about his photo book um, this week was number five in the U.S. on iTunes for music interviews. And wow. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you everybody who listens. Thanks, guys. And then overall, I think overall, um, Three Sides of the Coin as a show is number seven. So you guys, awesome. Thank you so much. Number seven in the U.S.? Number seven in the U.S. as overall for, for music, music interview shows. Everything combined. Music interview shows. Um, wow, so, I just opened this uh, this book. It's awesome. Tommy's, yeah, that, that Tommy, take it Tommy's off. Tommy's changing tar- topics already. Squirrel. So let me wrap up so Mark can go eat. Head over to YouTube, hit the subscribe button. We need to continue to blow Dr. Fuck out of the water with the most subscribers. And head over to iTunes and leave us a review and rating. It's so appreciative. Thank you so much. And we will yeah. see everybody next week. <clears throat> So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Download your free free copy of the KISS School of Marketing. 11 Lessons I Learned Working with KISS. The number one downloaded business book on Noise Trade. Go to books.noisetrade.com slash Michael Brandvold. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.